Hi, I'm Jen Beaumont, founder of Beyond the States. I want to start by thanking you for attending our European Virtual College Fair. I'm confident that this event will give you the information you need to understand and explore the options in Europe. So before I get into the meat of the presentation, I want to give you some tips for making the most out of uh, this fair this weekend. This is the first of scheduled presentations this weekend. And after each presentation concludes, the, re the replay will be put in the replay section here in the auditorium. That way you can always come back and uh, to it at any point until Wednesday evening. There's also a scheduled time each day in which representatives from each of the universities will be attending their booths so you can video chat with them and ask questions and such. You can visit their booths and gather information at any time, even when reps aren't there, and collect information and leave questions that they'll get back to you um, about a little bit later. I also have scheduled time in my booth each day. I'd love to meet. Please feel free to stop by with any questions or just leave them for me if it's an un unattended time. What I really hope is that this event gets you excited about the incredible possibilities in Europe. So let's get into some basic information you're gonna need as you start exploring the fair. As you may know, I'm a mother myself. My kids are currently 14 and 17, but I've been thinking about college for a while. When my oldest Sam was finishing middle school, the film Race to Nowhere was really big. I'd seen it myself, and I was really troubled by the rat race and pressure cooker environment of high school these days, just in order, or an attempt really, to get into college. And it's not just the Ivies that have crazy uh, low admissions rates. Even state schools have low rates, with UCLA around 18%, and the College of the Ozarks, which I had, which I had never even heard of, except just 9% of their applicants. I really wanted these high school years to include opportunities for the exploration of interests instead of a less meaningful checklist of accomplishments. I wanted to continue family dinners. I wanted my kids to experience the learning that accompanies you know, those tedious high school jobs. I've been under the impression that the US had the best higher education system in the world. I don't know why I blindly believed that for so long. I learned about this large scale study conducted by the Institute of International Education. This study found that U.S. students with a four-year bachelor's degree scored below their counterparts in 19 of the 21 participating countries. And these same U.S. kids scored the same, the kids with their bachelor's degrees in the U.S. scored the same as those who only had a high school education in three of the top performing countries. It's really not surprising that so many kids are returning home after college and struggling with under or unemployment given this. Of course, I also had concerns about the cost of higher education. I knew that colleges were getting insanely expensive, but I didn't realize how incredibly quickly the cost was growing. There's a site I found, it's called College Calc, and it looks at historical tuition rates, the rate of increase, and predicted tuition in the future. I don't know if any of you have kids who are in eighth grade or younger, but you're gonna to wanna to check this out if you do. I pulled these numbers for a presentation I did in Atlanta last year. You can see what it costs when I went to college, I'm dating myself, what tuition is now, and what is expected to be in five years. It's unbelievable. The projected annual tuition, annual tuition in 2023 at Emory is $89,500 for a year. And projected in-state tuition at the University of Georgia is $36,000. So with all this in mind, in 2015, I eagerly clicked on an article about an American student studying in Germany that showed up in my Facebook feed. At that point, I didn't even know that you could get a full degree taught in English in non-Anglophone countries. I thought the options were limited to doing a semester abroad. I assumed the degree options would be really limited or they'd be extremely expensive, but I decided to check it out in case it was something that I wanted to keep on, on our radar for my own kids in the future. I can't even tell you how overwhelming it was trying to figure things out. I was looking at an entire continent. So there were a ton of differences, not only from the US, but also between the different countries within Europe. I couldn't find a single source of information to learn about this, but I learned enough about the benefits to know that other families would be interested in knowing about these possibilities as well. It was then that I decided to start Beyond the States. Before I started working with families and students, I spent a year researching, visiting schools, talking to administrators, talking to American students who were already seeking their degrees there or had graduated, 
in order to provide this comprehensive, objective, and firsthand source of information to families. I continue to visit schools each year in Europe, which I love. And I have to say, the schools participating here today are awesome in their offerings. They're, they really are top notch, but the possibilities are not limited to just these that are here today. There are more than 300 universities in continental Europe that offer more than 1,700 English taught bachelor's degree programs. Now, just like anywhere, there are exceptional schools and, and less than exceptional schools, but I do my best to educate about red flags as well as strengths. Okay, so let's get to the good stuff. The obvious advantage, and the one that usually is a first to grab people's attention, is tuition. The average tuition international students pay for bachelor's degree programs in continental Europe is around 7,000 US dollars per year. There are almost 400 programs with tuitions under $4,000 a year, and at least 50 options that are tuition free, even for international students. The savings are further increased when you factor in that many, or most actually, most bachelor's programs in Europe take three or three and a half years to complete. In many cases, it costs less to obtain a full bachelor's degree in Europe, including travel cost, than attending a U.S. private or out-of-state school for a single year. So in order to make this benefit less abstract, I'd like to give you an example of how much money uh, my family is saving by sending Sam to school in Europe. So I've always thought that college is a great time to get out of your comfort zone and get away from home. So for that reason, if we were looking in the U.S., which we're not, we'd likely be looking at an out-of-state uh, school and out-of-state tuition. A U.S. school that offers majors that would be a good fit for Sam is Middlebury College, a, a private university in Vermont. So as you can see on this slide, over the entire degree, we're saving more than $200,000. Now, of course, that's an interesting stat because we don't necessarily have $2,000 to save, but it certainly speaks to debt we will not incur throughout Sam's studies and eventually my daughter's as well. I provide more information on this in the Paying for College in Europe webinar. You'll learn there about financial aid, how to assess affordability beyond tuition, and more. Next, I want to talk about differences and benefits around admission. There's another presentation this weekend, um, today actually, that dives deep into this, but I'm going to touch on it for a few minutes here too. In most cases, there's an entirely different mindset around admissions. Schools are focused on finding students who have the qualifications needed to succeed in their programs. These qualifications are generally defined and transparent. The first mindset we really need to unlearn when we're looking at schools in Europe has to do with correlating selectivity with desirability or quality. In Europe, selectivity does not correlate with educational quality. There are some incredible high quality and reputable schools with something called non-selective enrollment. It's actually not even called that. It doesn't even have a name. It's just the way things are done in some places. So I hope you're sitting down for this. What it means is that programs that don't have an enrollment cap for those programs, if you apply by the deadline and meet the requirements, then you're in. I want to play you a few minutes of an interview I did with an administrator from Groningen, who's actually here this weekend, about uh, what matters in non-selective enrollment. I'll go through a list of factors that matter in the U.S. admissions process, and you can say matters or doesn't matter in terms of if it, how it is, it, if it matters in your admissions department. Okay. okay. Yeah. So let's say the applicant has a 25 on their ACT. Doesn't matter. The applicant has a 35 on their ACT. Doesn't matter. The applicant was president of five clubs. <laughs> we don't care. <laughs> the applicant was active in sports. Doesn't matter. The applicant was in no clubs and enjoys playing video games in their spare time. Doesn't matter. The applicant has 10 AP classes. Uh, we would love to have him as a student, but it doesn't matter. You guys, how refreshing is that? My son Sam is applying to a school like this. It's actually one of the schools here today, Leiden University. Part of the beauty is that he doesn't need a safety school. They require three AP scores of three or higher and a 3.5 GPA. He had both of those things going into his senior year. They don't care about his extracurriculars, thank goodness, or his ACT or SAT scores. He doesn't have to write an essay about his favorite word, which was seriously a U.S. prompt I heard about from uh, last year. Now, the reason Sam needed those AP scores is that there are some countries in which a U.S. high school diploma is not the equivalent of their own high school diploma. 
So they have additional requirements in order to make the diploma equivalent to their own. These few countries require the applicant to have either an IB diploma, a year of college credits, or a certain number of AP test scores of three or higher. Even this is non-competitive though. It doesn't matter if you have 10 APs, so long as you have the three or four needed. In terms of SATs and ACTs, Germany's the only country that requires them at a country level, uh, and they also require a specific score. Other schools may request them, but that's not generally the case since they're drawing students from so many other countries where the SAT isn't necessarily a huge thing like it is here. There are a couple of countries that uh, require entrance exams, and some of them allow SAT scores to substitute for the exam. We get into these requirements in a lot more detail in the admissions presentation. I think for me, the big thing here is transparency. Yes, most places are really rigid about their requirements, but you know what those requirements are going into it. For my family, this has probably been as much of a benefit, an immediate and tangible benefit really, as the savings involved. Okay, so the other major difference in Europe is that when a student applies, they're applying to a specific program at a university as opposed to the university as a whole. It's sort of like knowing and declaring your major ahead of time. This does mean that your gen ed requirements are related to your area of study. This allows you to graduate knowing a lot about a specific area, but you still have the opportunity to explore other interest areas through electives, the study abroad semester, and things like honors programs. A chemistry student, for instance, won't be required to take Economics 101 or Philosophy 101, like I was required to as a psychology major, but they are able to, if they desire, through the other avenues I mentioned. The other thing I want to note is that you don't need to know exactly what you want to study. There are interdisciplinary programs, as well as programs where you start broad and then specialize later. Let's look at some of the examples from the schools that are here today. So Taltech has an integrated engineering program. The program, and this comes directly from the website as I don't know anything about engineering, this program unites different engineering subjects and different fields such as IT, business and process management, design and product development, mechatronics, and the digitalization of production. Uh, Kosminski, these are all business programs, but you do choose your specialization uh, further along in the program, and you can choose from entrepreneurship, marketing, and international management. That's after the first year. Toulouse Business School really gives students the ability to customize their program. Students choose uh, both a competency and a specialty area, and their program is designed around that. Uh, at the University of Page, surprisingly, the health science programs include a multidisciplinary approach. Their physiotherapy program, for instance, includes things like integrated health sociology, health psychology, uh, philosophy, the history of health science, in addition to the more hardcore science classes that they have as well. So in the Netherlands, all of the Dutch universities have university college programs. And these are liberal arts programs at the school and students choose their major uh, the second year. Groningen, University of Groningen, actually has two university colleges to choose from. Uh, Erasmus University of Rotterdam, they have both their university college and a program at the main university called Management of International Social Challenges. And this program, again, straight from the website, looks at international challenges from a political, economic, legal, and social perspective in order to determine ways to find solutions to those problems. This is actually a really popular choice for a lot of students I've worked with since it combines so many different areas. Um, Leiden University, again, they also have a university college. And then the International Studies program is what my son has applied for. And it focuses on history, culture, economics, and politics first, sort of a broad level, and then around a specific region that the student chooses, along with the language from that area as well. Anglo-American University offers a humanities, society, and culture program. And this combines philosophy, religion, anthropology, gender studies, cultural studies, art, and literature. This is not an exhaustive list of all the interdisciplinary programs at the schools here today. It's just to say that there are good options for just about anyone. Whether you have a lot of interest you want to pursue, a singular interest, or you're still unsure. So now let's talk about the quality of education. 
Before getting into this, I want to revisit this study. Like I said before, though I consider myself a critical thinker, I didn't display it in this area. I just blindly believed that U.S. higher education was the best in the world. Subconsciously, it might have been due to the large number of universities that are globally ranked. Here's the thing, though. We all know about the U.S. News and World Report rankings of the U.S. universities. Though these rankings have their own huge set of flaws, they do base the ranking on a variety of factors. Global rankings, however, whether it's U.S. News, Times Higher Education, Shanghai, and the other large ones, they're 100% based on research-related measures. Not only does this say very little about the undergraduate experience, but it also means that a large number of schools, whether they're small schools, specialty schools, business schools, all the universities of applied science, they're not even eligible for the ranking. Usually though, when people ask about the quality of education, they wanna make sure that the degree is recognized if the student applies to graduate school outside of Europe, and they also want to know about the impact it'll have on employability in the future. So in 1999, the Bologna Declaration was signed. And what this did was created a European higher education area so that there are comparable degrees among the various European countries. So due to this, universities uh, here in the U.S. recognize bachelor's degrees from accredited European schools. And all the schools here today and that are in my book and listed in Beyond the States, they're all fully accredited, even those that are three years in duration. Just in case you're skeptical, here's information pulled from the admissions websites of some of the schools here in the U.S. I particularly like the wording from Dartmouth. That said, you also have the option to continue with your master's in Europe. Some master's degree programs are just a year in duration, meaning that you can have your bachelor's degree and your master's degree in less time than it will take many of your friends in high school, from high school, to finish just their undergraduate degree, given the high proportion of students who take six years to graduate here in the US. So let's talk about the impact on employment after graduation. Studying in Europe as an international student gives you a competitive edge in employment in a number of ways. For one, internships are a much more common option, sometimes mandatory, and factored into a semester of the program. Given that employers hire 50 to 75% of the interns that work for them, this is certainly a factor. Of course, kids who take advantage of the language learning opportunities have even more employment possibilities. Most meaningful, though, are the soft skills gained by studying abroad. These are the ones employers are looking for and finding lacking uh, in graduates from the U.S. These are things like group work. You study abroad and you're showing you're comfortable working with people with other perspectives, that you're flexible, adaptable, that you're able to navigate unfamiliar circumstances. And this really, it's not just anecdotal. There's a recent study done by the Institute of International Education that found that studying abroad for longer periods of time has a high impact not only on job offers, but job advancement. So the final thing I want to touch on today is student life. And we're going to talk in depth about this with students themselves in our student panel presentation tomorrow. But I do want to discuss a few major differences. So I live in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Uh, UNC Chapel Hill and Duke University are within 15 minutes of each other. However, you will not find these students at the same parties. Their life is really specific to campus. You certainly wouldn't find them in the same dorms. In Europe, a student's life is as connected to the city as it is to the school, if not more so. Universities don't usually own their own housing. Thus they might contract and offer housing through um, reserve rooms for their students through the various student residence providers. But dorms then have students from different schools around the city. Students usually have a private room and then share a common space in a kitchen area with a group of other students. I really think this is such an ideal setup because it provides privacy without the isolation. You might be wondering why there are kitchens. Well, it's because there aren't the meal plans that students have here in the US. Yeah, universities have cafeterias and their canteens, but they're not set up for three meals a day, seven days a week. Students cook a lot of their meals, which turns into this great intercultural, multicultural event. This is really an aspect of student life in Europe that I think is so cool. I mean, just think about it. English taught programs in Europe 
are created to draw students from around the world. The students in the dorms will, will be from around the world. The students in, in your classes will be from around the world. What better way to become a global citizen than this? Not to mention the fact that after graduating, there you have sofas around the world to crash on when you, when you travel. So like I said, there are other presentations that go into these topics in more depth that you can uh, attend or watch later. But I do think this gives you the basic information you need as you start to visit the booths of the different universities and, and explore this weekend. If you want to prevent information overload, you can space things out a bit. All of the replays, like I said, will be available for the next five days here in the auditorium in the replay area. I really hope that you enjoy this event. Feel free to pop over to my booth if you have any questions or just to say hi. Thanks.